Good evening. If you come on in, have a seat. There's still some seats up in the front. Uh, we don't mind having people in the front row. Um, you know, there's an old speaker's trick that I can't do now uh, because we have some people already sitting in the front row. But typically, if people come in and they don't have any seats in the front row, uh, we're looking at empty rows in front of us. And so once the meeting starts, then we have someone come in and remove all the empty seats from the front row. So we create a new front row with people in it. Uh, but I'm glad that we've got people sitting here now. Uh, so I'm Ron Latz, State Senator from Senate District 46. Um, I uh, uh, was flanked by uh, my legislative colleagues, uh, Representative Winkler and, and Joachim. And we're going to take a few minutes to introduce ourselves and uh, talk for a few minutes also about the uh, upcoming legislative session. This is our annual uh, town hall that we have before the legislative session. Uh, in which we come to make ourselves available uh, to the, uh, anyone who wants to come here um, from within our constituencies to share uh, with us your thoughts about uh, proposed policies at the state level or changes to state laws um, or whatever else is happening that uh, we might have an impact on that you'd like to share with us. Questions, comments are welcome. Uh, just a word of caution, this is not a partisan event. Uh, so for those of you who are partisanly inclined for either political party uh, or any of the political parties out there, uh, please uh, do not get into that side of things. Uh, this is an open forum, however, for anyone who wants to talk about uh, the issues. Um, and if you are not a constituent uh, from our districts, uh, then uh, we ask you, I don't mind if you ask a question or two, but please don't try to hog the mic. Um, having the impact of, of making it harder for the people who do live in the district that we represent to uh, share their thoughts with us. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, this is being broadcast uh, on uh, St. Louis Park Community Television um, and uh, live right now and then uh, will be rebroadcast uh, all hours of the day and night. Um, and, uh, and I know that there are people watch it at 3 o'clock in the morning as well. Um, so. Yeah, insom insomniacs, that's correct. Or they work a, a different shift <laughs> than uh, many of us do. Um, so when we have questions, uh, I'd ask you to please step forward to the mics that are in front, state your name and the city where you live, uh, and that way your question can be recorded for the uh, broadcast. And for the audience at home, uh, we'll be able to hear what you have to say um, about whatever your topic is. Uh, that said, I'm going to jump right in uh, with a bit of an introduction. Um, I represent Senate District 46 in the State Senate. That's all of St. Louis Park, all of Hopkins, about a third of Golden Valley, um, all of Medicine Lake, and about a quarter of Plymouth. <clears throat> I uh, live in St. Louis Park uh, with my wife and our uh, three children, uh, two of whom are in college now, uh, one here at the U, uh, one outstate, um, and we have a sixth grader at home as well. Um, I'm an attorney uh, by profession. Uh, this is a part-time legislature. In fact, all of us have jobs outside of the legislature um, as well. Um, and uh, the legislature uh, will be starting up uh, this February uh, for a session that should last until uh, late May. Uh, I serve as the uh, lead uh, for the minority party in the Senate on the Judiciary Committee, uh, and I also serve on the Commerce Committee. And over the course of my uh, legislative career, both in the House and the Senate, in addition to those committees, I've served on the uh, K-12 Policy Committee. Um, I've served on uh, a Jobs and Economic Development uh, Committee um, and a Higher Education uh, Committee, as well as a number of others. So uh, I used to serve on the City Council in St. Louis Park before I was elected to the House um, in 2002's election. Uh, so I'm glad to be back in the Council Chambers and I'm also glad that it was renovated since the time that I served in here. Um, I think maybe I'll just leave that with the introduction. Uh, we've got, uh, let's do the introductions first and then we'll jump into uh, the discussion about policy and so on. So, Cheryl? Um, hi, I'm Representative Cheryl Joaquin. I represent Hopkins and St. Louis Park, the half basically south of Minnetonka Boulevard. Um, during the interim, I work as a paraprofessional over at, let, just, let, this, just this last year, I was at Aquila Elementary. 
um, mostly with uh, kiddos with special needs, and then uh, have three kids of our own um, who are in variety <coughs> levels of college experience right now, and then a husband who has been a teacher at Hopkins for about 25 years. Good evening, uh, I'm Ryan Winkler, state representative from Golden Valley, the southern half of Golden Valley, the northern half of St. Louis Park, the south uh, east corner of Plymouth, and the entire community of Medicine Lake. Uh, I'm serving uh, in a non-consecutive sixth term in the state house, first elected in 2006, uh, and I serve as the majority leader of the state house, uh, which means that I help uh, Cheryl and 73 other members of the house try to enact uh, the legislation that affects everything from the state budget uh, to our health care, water quality, air, uh, higher education, K-12 system, uh, property taxes, you name it. Uh, we have a team that is working on all of those issues and it's my job to help that team do as well as we possibly can in representing the views and values of the people of the whole state. Um, and so I have a mixed role of being both a representative from this district and for helping uh, make the whole state uh, run through the state house. Uh, I live in Golden Valley. I have three boys, all of whom play Hopkins hockey. In, uh, you know, not college, I can't announce that, but uh, in uh, high school peewees and squirts. And that is, if anything, a busier job than being majority leader of the house for at least this part of the year. So I look forward to the conversation tonight, and Ron, maybe you want to get started on kind of what we look, we're looking at coming up ahead. So uh, thank you. Uh, um, before I jump into that, I do want to recognize uh, at least two people that I've noticed here in the audience. Uh, Gail Dorfman, uh, who is a former uh, council member and mayor of St. Louis Park, former board of the uh, uh, county board in Hennepin County as well, um, and uh, met council member, a lot of public uh, uh, service in your career. Thank you, Gail, for joining us tonight. Thanks for all your service. And uh, our Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan joins us today with her uh, new husband, Tom. Um, and Peggy also lives in the district and is a former state representative from this district as well. So. I have a school board member here as well. Yes. Brand new Yes. All right. So. Um, I'll jump into the policy uh, side. This is the uh, upcoming legislative session where we don't have to uh, necessarily deal with the budget. Uh, we set a two-year state budget uh, two years ago, or last year, um, and so we're in the middle of that cycle right now. So uh, frankly, um, with the projection that we're gonna have uh, more revenue on the table than ex projected expenses, uh, we don't have to uh, accomplish anything specific this upcoming legislative session. Uh, we do have a duty to balance the budget, so if we had a projected revenue shortfall, we'd have to make sure that the numbers lined up and we were balanced. Uh, but uh, uh, there, I'm sure that one of the things we will be looking at is what to do with um, the uh, revenues that we have, and there will be a variety of proposals uh, to accomplish that, um, I expect. Uh, in terms of uh, spending that was not approved last time that uh, because there weren't sufficient funds to be able to do what some uh, legislators wanted to do in terms of spending, um, and uh, probably uh, some other proposals as well. I would expect we'll see proposals for some tax relief uh, along with some additional spending proposals. Uh, this is also typically the part of the cycle where we look very seriously at a capital investment or a bonding bill uh, to make long-term investments in infrastructure in Minnesota. Uh, that includes uh, all of the buildings that the state owns uh, the buildings that uh, the higher education systems own, um, and a lot of uh, infrastructure that are of regional significance, uh, ranging uh, from uh, water utility investments, uh, sewage treatment, uh, community centers, civic centers, uh, and a variety of other things. Um, there will be some bonding projects that are more local in nature. Um, I know for one uh, prospectus family centers has a longstanding uh, application uh, for uh, a bonding project to expand their facility. Um, and uh, I know I'm carrying that in the Senate. Um, and uh, we will uh, hopefully get that accomplished this year. But uh, the bonding bill is, is subject uh, to a more unique political dynamic because we can't pass it with a simple majority. We have to have super majorities in the House and in the Senate, uh, which with the current makeup in the bodies means we have to have strong bipartisan support uh, from both uh, the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, to pass the bonding bill. 
so that means there's a lot, uh, a lot more negotiation uh, than uh, might otherwise be expected to, to get um, about the size of the bonding bill and about the content of the bonding bill. Uh, and uh, we tried, came close last year to having a bonding bill as well, uh, but we did not, uh, which means that we've got some pent up demand for projects that weren't funded last year, weren't funded in the last several cycles. Um, but uh, that do have uh, great public support and regional significance. So I think you'll see a lot of activity around the bonding bill this year as well as around what to do with our uh, revenues that we have um, in state government. Um, so with that uh, short uh, remarks, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Cheryl. Do you want to go? Yes, first? and here I forgot. Um, well, first, I want to, I am so sorry we missed you, Laura McClendon. Cl Clendon, and I'm going to totally say that wrong, is one of our new St. Louis Park School Board members that's in the audience, so thank you for serving. Um, and then I forgot to say what committees I serve on. I always forget <coughs> something. So I chair the Education Policy Committee. I'm also on the Education Finance Committee. I'm on the Transportation Policy and Finance Committee, and I'm on the Full Tax Committee. So um, looking forward to session, and as uh, Senator Latt said, it's a policy year and a bonding year. I'm carrying the bonding bill for perspectives in the House, um, and there will be a variety of policy bills that are out there as well. And we may or may not have a small supplemental budget bill that comes up after the February forecast. What we run into, though, is it always looks like a bigger number than it truly is because the forecast includes um, uh, inflation on the forecast side, but not on the expenditure side. So. All the bills we've passed that cost money, it's kind of not taking into account any inflation on those for this next year. So that number really isn't always what it looks like. But that being said, there'll still be a lot of bills that people put in to try to have um, a little bit of funding. I have one that I'm resurrecting that is going to try to go out and figure out how we can do um, uh, folks having being able to file their state taxes online for free. Um, and then I'm working on one for a program called MinFire, the Hometown Heroes Act, and it helps with um, getting a base of money for volunteer firefighters to focus on health care and um, mental health um, access to that. So with that being said, um, education policy, we're going to really focus this year on things that work for students in the class, what they need in the classroom, and then the tools our teachers, staff, and administrators need to deliver quality education, and they kind of fall into three different buckets. Um, we're really going to focus on mental health in our schools, um, working again on the opportunity gap, and then also kind of a catch-all of our school community where it looks at what kind of training our teachers need, um, the support staff that we need. As I said, I'm a paraprofessional during the interim, so it's a great place for me to be to see the front lines of what our schools, how they're functioning, what our kids need, what our teachers need what our schools basically need to make sure our kids get quality education. So I will leave it at that because I'm anxious to hear your questions. Uh, so I'll just take a kind of a slightly broader view. Uh, we in Minnesota have the only divided legislature in the country. Uh, and the fact that we were able to pass a budget last session into law with the cooperation of Senate Republicans, House Democrats, and Governor Walls, uh, was a minor miracle of functional government compared to state government shutdowns and special sessions and so forth that we've seen in years past when we've had uh, this divide uh, take place. But we had a number of uh, compromises in what we did that um, kind of masked the shortcomings of our current situation. Uh, we managed to pass a budget that had uh, increased funding for the K-12 school system, but not really much more than uh, keeping pace with inflation, so no significant change there. Uh, we passed legislation related to health care and prescription drugs, uh, but unfortunately they did not make it through the state Senate with the Republicans in charge there. We addressed climate change, early childhood, affordable uh, housing, uh, college tuition debt, uh, and bills related to immigration and refugees. So there are a lot of things on the table from last session that did not get signed into law and I think will be uh, just as difficult in this next session to sign into law. So this is not a year coming up in my forecast anyway for great progress uh, or accomplishment for the state of Minnesota at the state legislative level. I think it will be a year of uh, workmanlike uh, taking care of basic issues like uh, capital investment bill, minor policy changes, uh, maybe something with the budget, 
hopefully something on insulin, uh, and that will probably be about all. So, um, you know, all of that is in the context of a 2020 election cycle that I think is going to be far more attention getting than anything that we are doing at the state legislature or anything in state politics. And I think from a civic and uh, personal standpoint, it will test all of our ability to remain committed to the common good and working with our fellow citizens, sometimes even with our own family members, in making sure that this experiment in democratic self-government is something that we can all believe in, despite uh, how, I think, challenging this next election year is going to be. So I put the, I put the legislative session kind of in that context. It will be, uh, I think, uh, there will be a lot of noise, and there will be a lot of politics, and there will be, hopefully, some infrastructure that comes from it. But I think beyond that, uh, this is a year for us to, uh, I hope, really focus on the core belief that we all share that we can solve our problems together, even with great differences among us. And we are going to keep trying to do that at the legislature, despite the challenges. Right. So now let's hear from you. Um, if you have a question, please come on up to the uh, podium here. Uh, stand in line respectfully, and uh, please again announce uh, your name and what city that you're from, and then tell us what's on your mind. Uh, Judy Cashton. I'm uh, from a few blocks away in St. Louis Park, and I'm speaking about uh, redistricting reform. I talked about it last time, and I'm bringing it up again. We're trying to be patient, positive, and persistent about this. You know, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, so I see a lot of the uh, fallout of the current political climate. Um, I actually have two patients in the opposite party. I won't be partisan about it. And they're very nice people. I enjoy talking to them. They have a lot of good thoughts. But when you read about it, and you know, we know how polarized it's gotten. And I think if we don't change redistricting, we're going to be stuck with that because the most extreme member of each part, you know, of the districts get elected. So uh, the organization is Minnesota Alliance for Democracy, and we've do been doing a lot of door knocking and uh, talking to citizens, and we've been circulating this petition that calls for the nonpartisan uh, independent commission to set voting districts. And uh, right now, there's interest from both parties about this, particularly because, as you know, if the Democrats end up in power, Republicans better watch it. So we, we uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, most people I talk to say, of course we want that, that just makes sense. So uh, the commission is, it, and you know the legislation already, it was introduced and it didn't get passed through. I wonder if you have thoughts about what you've already said, you're not too optimistic about it. I wonder if you have any suggestions for us, thoughts about it. And, and finally, I thank you for your service. I, we really appreciate all you're doing. Uh, thank you, Jody. Um, <clears throat> as to the redistricting, you know, there was a, there's been commissions, bipartisan commissions in the past, independent commissions that have looked at this and made recommendations. Um, and even, uh, uh, even they have had a hard time sometimes coming to consensus. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think there's a developing consensus, uh, at least one that I share, uh, which is that we ought to have a nonpartisan independent commission that does the redistricting. Um, in, as a practical matter, we have had a lot of nonpartisan redistricting done in the past because yes. the legislature and the governor couldn't all agree on a plan, and the courts ended up doing it. Uh, and uh, so uh, personally, I, I agree with that. Um, you did raise an interesting point that uh, the districts can be drawn in such a way that the most extreme uh, uh, members or residents of the district uh, have a better chance of getting elected to the legislature, which contributes to polarization. Um, I will tell you that my approach uh, to legislating uh, has, has been to bring progressive values to my work, which I think reflects this community, but also to focus on getting real results. Um, and uh, sometimes that process uh, means you have to move a little bit off of, of your ideal outcomes uh, in order to make progress uh, toward the goal that you would like to see. Um, and I think that also reflects this district, and I hope that however the districts get drawn again, um, that that's the kind of leadership that will end up in the legislature, because I think that's what uh, serves our communities best. Yes. I would just add to that, too. It's a, it's also more about making sure that the process is fair. Yeah. So people feel comfortable and feel like they've been represented so that the process of redistricting is fair. And that's why I've signed on to the bill to have a nonpartisan 
um, board to do that. And it you was know very disappointing. Have... We did not get much election yes. law passed last year, yeah. even off the House floor. So, do you see any chance of it getting through through committee, or through to the Senate? So last session in our state government finance bill, we had an elections article that included right. a redistricting right. uh, committee council essentially mm -hmm. making recommendations to implement a constitutional amendment. And more than one uh, House Democrat has been working on legislation with Common Cause and with other groups to put forward an independent redistricting commission. I see no reason why that wouldn't pass the House again. Mm -hmm. The challenge last year was that uh, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, right. who is responsible for elections in the Senate, was really uninterested entirely in making that change. And just right. for those who do not follow the ins and outs in great detail on redistricting, uh, under the federal constitution, we have to have a census every 10 years. State legislatures are given the power to redraw congressional maps. And under uh, U.S. Supreme Court precedent, they also have to redraw state legislative maps every 10 years. And the legislature is in charge, but can, can delegate that authority uh, th to draw the maps initially to a commission. Uh, it couldn't give that commission the ability to turn them into law. It would have to actually come back to the legislature. Or we could create a constitutional amendment that would actually give an independent commission full authority to implement that, in implement the new laws. And so there is some disagreement about how best to address a nonpartisan approach to redistricting. Uh, but as I said, uh, you know, we're open to a lot of things in the House, but we've really had trouble getting any attention at all from Senator Kiffmeyer. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good My name is George Beck, and we live in the Triangle neighborhood of St. Louis Park. And I, I think you probably guess how we got our name over there. Um, it's a triangle. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit also about redistricting. And I'd like to mention what happened in Wisconsin in 2011. Um, at that time, the legislature and the governor's office were all in one political party. And so they proceeded to draw the maps for redistricting for the legislative seats and congressional seats. Um, well, it was gerrymandered terribly. And um, what happened was that about 49% of the statewide vote was uh, in favor of the Republicans, and yet they ended up with 61% of the seats in the assembly. And that's what gerrymandering is. It means that a lot of people were disenfranchised, essentially, because they, didn't, they weren't represented in their district. Um, so we don't want that to happen in Minnesota. That's undemocratic, and it has no place in a uh, democracy. About, I think about 20 states now have some kind of commission, some kind of influence by the public on the legislature uh, in order to set district boundaries. Minnesota is behind the times in that regard. Uh, with all due respect, legislators have an inherent conflict of interest in setting boundaries in maps uh, because you can draw boundaries to ensure your own re-election. Uh, in Wisconsin, they pick their own constituents instead of the other way around, which is why, the way I think we do it here in Minnesota. Um, we need the commission. Um, and I'm reminded that due to a conflict of interest, we set up a commission to set salaries for the legislature. And this conflict of interest is no different and quite possibly even more significant um, in a democracy. Um, gerrymandering has some uh, bad consequences like gridlock in the legislature as districts become um, reelected, the same people are reelected each time and citizens get discouraged. I mean, that's one more factor. They think, well, uh, what's, what's the big deal? Um, we're not gonna really have our own choice. House File 1605 establishes a commission and a set of principles to be followed in drawing maps, such, for example, as not considering an incumbent's residence, 
and not considering voting records, uh, which may be available to political parties after the presidential primary this year. There will be a rally to support this legislation on the first day of the session at 3 p.m. in the state capital rotunda, and we do have a permit. Um, so um, we're hoping to attract all of the democracy groups um, to that event. It's sponsored uh, by Represent Us and the other democracy groups in Minnesota. I hope you saw the letter this morning in the Star Tribune. That woman back there wrote it. And, uh, Don't steal her thunder, George. She made, the, she made the point that action must be taken this session if we are to ensure that we have a fair procedure for establishing our legislative districts that will be in effect for the next 10 years. In other words, this matter is urgent. You're the guardians of our democracy and democracy is under attack in our country. Please support and help to pass redistricting reform this year. Thank you. Thank you, George. I just want to thank George, too, for his years of advocacy around all things election reform, including the Sunshine Law and some of the other stuff we've been trying to pass. So thank you. Come on forward. All right. Uh, I'm Cliff Cashton. I live in St. Louis Park. I'm here tonight as a member of the Minnesota Let People Vote Coalition. Um, our goals are to maximize voter participation, to remove barriers to voting, and to make sure everyone's vote counts. Um, my question tonight has to do with restore the vote legislation. Uh, you know very well that uh, House File 40 uh, in the session last year uh, was legislation uh, to, that would, allow, would have allowed people to vote once they were no longer incarcerated, uh, changing the current situation where people uh, are not allowed to vote until they've finished their entire term, including uh, supervised release. Um, my question to you is uh, what, you, what do you see as the prospects for this legislation in the coming session? and whether the uh, lawsuit that the ACLU has filed against the Secretary of State uh, to overturn the current law uh, may affect how the legislation fares in the legislature. Um, well, Cliff, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> the, the restore the vote is sometimes referred to as uh, felony voting um, because the people who are on parole on supervised release after incarceration um, and who are prohibited from voting under state law are people who are convicted felons um, and uh, have already served their in custody sentence time and that's where the argument is is around although there is at least one state um, where uh, uh, people who are in prison are still allowed to vote too uh, but um, I, I've worked for many many years to try to pass one version or another of, of restore the vote, trying to find the political sweet spot that we'd get enough support um, in, in the Senate to pass it. Uh, we haven't found it yet. Um, there is some bipartisan support for the notion. Uh, there is uh, some arguments over whether there ought to be one or two years after release from incarceration as a transitional time. Uh, and uh, for me personally, I think that uh, once someone is out of incarceration and they're back in the community, uh, they are entitled to and we want them to be able to vote. Uh, number one, we want them to transition successfully back into the community uh, where they have a stake in the outcome of, of elections um, and uh, where they can feel a part of the community around them. They're more likely to be successful and to not reoffend um, when they are in the communities as a result. Uh, secondly, I go back to the, uh, the reason that the United States exists as a separate entity uh, from uh, England. Uh, we fought taxation without representation um, as a basis for the, the Boston Tea Party, among other things. Um, and uh, we still have the situation now where people who are released into the community are working, paying rent, their property taxes, they own the homes, 
Um, uh, they have jobs, they're buying things, they're paying sales taxes, income taxes, but they don't have a say in who their elected representatives are. Uh, to me, that's fundamentally un-American. Uh, so from uh, that values perspective, as well as the practical perspective that we all want those persons to succeed in their reintegration into society, uh, I think uh, we ought to allow them to vote once they uh, leave uh, custody. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly simple remedy uh, that we can do, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, very fraught politically. Uh, we'll keep fighting for it. I will keep fighting for it. Um, I don't know that we have the votes to pass it in the Senate right now. Um, and it is something that can be used as a political wedge as well. So in a campaign year, it makes it a little bit tougher even to take votes uh, that legislators might support but feel a bit risky about. Uh, so not, I think the prospects are, are, are cloudy for this spring. Um, I think we should revisit the issue uh, if nothing happens this year uh, when we have some new membership in the legislature after the election. Yeah, I would just add that we, uh, this will be a continuing refrain. We did pass Restore the Vote in the House this year and sent it to the Senate where uh, Senator Kiff Meyer had no interest in taking up any elections related issues, even though uh, the bill does have bipartisan support. There was a rally at the beginning of session that included some very conservative Republicans there in support of it. And um, that doesn't mean, however, that their leadership is willing to bring the vote up or their committee chair is interested in doing it. So um, I think it's, it's just a will issue, you know, willingness to do it. I think the lawsuit against uh, the Secretary of State to try to overturn this can be used either way. If you oppose it, then you'll say, well, we shouldn't do anything until we know the outcome of this lawsuit. Um, and if they supported it, they could say, well, we need to make sure we take care of this so the courts don't force us on it. So like, unfortunately, many things at the legislature, you can, you can use it to make an argument on either direction. And it really comes down to the willingness to take the issue up and move on it. And we've seen just little interest on the part of Senate Republican leaders to take it up. And I just add to that to just keep up the pressure. I think the, mm -hmm. the public will is there. We need to get the political will there too. And you have an amazing champion in Representative Dean in the House. And I'm quite a few champions in the Senate as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello and welcome. Hi, good evening. I'm Marilyn Klug from St. Louis Park. And I'm coming to you and to the, to the um, community in bringing something to light that isn't in the light and has to be first in the light for things to change, and that is our um, child protection system in, in Minnesota. Uh, <clears throat> okay, the proposed bill of the African American Family Preservation Act, um, this is the third year at the Minnesota legislature, and it is not the last if it does not pass in 2020. The goal of the legislation is to address racial biases and disparities and for better standards of care across Minnesota child welfare system at each step of our child protection process. <clears throat> Minnesota statistics show that black youth are three times more likely than their white counterparts to be removed from their homes in the child protection system and also more likely to be placed with strangers instead of other relatives. When I found out this fact, and I've been involved with this ever since it first started, that was a real powerful statement, so I will say it again. Minnesota stats show that black youth are three times more likely than their white counterparts to be removed from their homes and in the child protection system also more likely to be placed with strangers instead of other relatives. <clears throat> in Minnesota, disparities have been shown to exist at every contact point on the child protection process. Racial disparities and biases are at play from reporting to the way African-American families receive or don't receive services to quality um, placement and termination of rights. This bill will protect black children and, their, and strengthen their families. The African American Family Preservation Act has a website with information and an action center. And it is preserveourfamilies.org. 
Again, that's preserveourfamilies.org. So there's a lot of information on there about facts and, um, and to learn about the act because it is, it is a big one. <laughs> there's a lot to go through. And so my question is, what will you do, um, the three of you, in, um, in fighting for and making this act um, become law? I can speak a little bit to that. So the uh, bill in the House is uh, carried by Representative Rena Moran from mm -hmm. St. Paul, the Frogtown neighborhood. Uh, and um, Rena and I have worked together in bringing advocates and stakeholders together to address this. She originally tried to model this on the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICTWA, mm -hmm. which um, because of diff separate federal legal standing for American Indian children, uh, it was possible to, do, to preserve family and cultural ties for Indian children, but it's a different standard for African American children because of various reasons. So um, she then has tried to find a way to achieve many of the same ends um, by changing the way that we do this. And so I've been helpful with her in bringing together people from counties to try to address these changes. And to, it really requires a cultural shift within the child protection system. Mm -hmm. And I think, the, as often is the case, that's the long-term change, but it also among the most difficult things to do. And so I think continuing to move this legislation along and highlighting the issue is very important. Uh, and hopefully over time, the legal changes can spur the kind of uh, greater understanding and cultural competency within the child protection system that's needed to address this issue. Okay, thank you. And I, I, only thing I would add too is we, we need some of that cultural competency and some of that change and thoughts when it comes to disparities in our schools too mm -hmm. with our inclusion and suspension act. So we've been working on that and education policy. Good. So I think it's a cultural change across many different parts of our, our government. And I have nothing to add except to say I support those efforts. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Devana Sand. I live in St. Louis Park, a uh, lifetime resident of this uh, community. Um, and I just really want to hear from you on uh, some of my big picture item issues that I'm concerned about um, up and coming. Uh, one is climate change. Um, in my opinion, that's a bipartisan issue. And from conservatives, liberals, everybody I know, it's an issue. Um, and then also I would like to hear uh, how you uh, plan to support both gender and racial equity. Those aren't small areas at all to tackle. No, though, like I said, they're big picture issues. And yes. I know we already kind of touched on some micro, but. And no, that's I, yeah. great. And I will I, know we do intend to try to end around 830. <laughs> so. I was just going to say, on um, the House, we have a climate change caucus now that has started to meet. And a lot of those issues are baked into all of our different committees. So it's not just one committee. We First time we've ever had a climate change committee in the House as well. So there's a lot of good work that's been doing. But it's stuff we have to look at in transportation. Mm -hmm. It's what we have to look at in education and how we're heating and cooling our schools. And I mean, it's, it's broader than just the mm -hmm. climate change committee. So very different ways of approaching that. And then the gender and racial equity same thing, it's across all of our, our committees that we talk about those issues. We've been working a lot in the Education Policy Committee to make sure that our teachers and school staff have the training they need to be culturally and racially sensitive, um, and we'll be continuing to do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we could spend a long time talking about all of these issues, and so I'll just try to highlight a few things that we're working on. Um, first of all, uh, we passed in the House this year a Renewables First uh, requirement for new energy so that uh, as new power is coming online, it has to be done with renewables. And if it can be done with renewables, renewables it has to be. We also pr passed a 100% uh, renewable energy standard by 2050 in the House. Again, those two provisions are not in law because of Senate Republicans. Um, but uh, we will continue to work on that. There, there is good news on climate, and not all of it is driven by policy changes. Uh, for example, uh, the market is changing pretty rapidly. Today, it is cheaper 
to install a new so to install new solar than it is to maintain an existing coal system. So it is actually easier and better uh, for a utility to invest in new renewables than it is to continue their existing coal plants. And so we are seeing the phase out of some of that. Uh, Google is building a massive data center in Big Lake, uh, and it's going to use, I think, more electricity than any other single site in the state of Minnesota. Because Google has made um, climate uh, promises to its customers, it has to have a source of electricity for that data center that is 100% renewable. And so as part of this project, they are also building the single largest uh, solar installation in the state of Minnesota as part of that project. So it's one way that citizens as consumers are demanding that their, the companies that they do business with are going to meet certain environmental standards. And that is changing the whole uh, electrical uh, supply chain by just by you know people like you and all the rest of us, frankly, showing up and saying we care about this standard we need to push, the marketplace is shifting. And we can help at the state level move those things along. But electricity production is one area. Of course, there are many more. The transportation uh, sector, the agriculture sector, and the industrial sector all are about equal um, contributors to carbon. And so we have a lot of work to, be, to do. Uh, but it's one of the areas where leadership at the state level and at the municipal level and in the marketplace by ordinary citizens is actually changing something uh, well ahead of where, for example, the federal government is. So we think we can continue that push. And the climate activism really is making a big difference, both at the, in the marketplace uh, and at the state level. Um, and there are so many things we can talk about with racial and gender equity. Um, you know, we talked all about restore the vote. I carried a bill for uh, immigrant driver's licenses so people could get a driver's license regardless of their uh, immigration status. Uh, the uh, achievement gap in education, health uh, disparities, education disparities outside of the K-12 system, uh, um, income disparities, all of those issues are very much part of what we look at all the time in the work that we're doing at the legislature. Um, but there's so much more to be done. And in my view, particularly racial inequity, climate change, and income inequality are three long-term major threats to the stability of our society, and we have to be trying to address those as best we possibly can. Thank you. Uh, the uh, Senate uh, just this year has established a, a, a climate uh, change caucus, um, of which I am a member. Um, I'm proud to, to do that. I think it is the existential question uh, for our, our time, um, not only for state policymakers or policymakers in general, but for all of us. Um, and uh, um, we have to take up the, the responsibility because the federal government is going backwards on it um, and to the point of trying to stop the states from making progress on it as well when we talk about uh, uh, automobile um, efficiency standards, fuel standards. Um, so uh, I support the governor's effort to, uh, to join uh, with the California standard and the pact of states uh, that do that for their fuel standards, um, and rather than regressing to a lower uh, fuel economy uh, uh, level. Um, and I think uh, the clean energy economy is uh, going to be thriving in the future. In fact, it's creating more jobs um, than anyone expected, um, and uh, it will continue to do so in the future. So it's, it's better for our economic growth to, for us to be investing individually and with state dollars um, in clean energy efforts um, and to make sure the, the, uh, the marketplace has a way uh, to, to move forward on that as well. Uh, with regard to gender and racial equity, um, a couple of years ago, uh, the, uh, my caucus in the Senate proposed, and we were successful in passing, um, a pretty broad proposal to make investments in racial um, equity in particular. Um, out of about uh, 60 or 70 million dollars in proposals that were identified, uh, and not all proposals carried a, a, a budget impact along with it, um, but we passed about 20 million dollars to make investments um, there to take steps uh, toward uh, equity. Um, we all live in the same community, one way or another. We are all affected by uh, what our diverse communities um, are going through. 
um, and not the least of which from a self-interested standpoint, um, is having sufficient qualified workers to continue to fuel um, the economy that we all rely on. Um, our businesses have identified workforce shortages as one of the primary challenges that they're facing. Uh, so it's, it's in all of our interests for um, people of every race and, and all genders to be able to, uh, uh, to get a, a full uh, and, and uh, quality education, um, to have equal access to jobs, um, and uh, because we'll all be better off as a result. So um, in our self-interest and because it's the right thing to do, um, I'm a strong supporter of those efforts as well. I did forget to mention there was one thing we were able to do, two things in the education policy bill that we actually did get passed into law. One was um, a statutory language that said a, a school districts may, so you should make sure St. Louis Park and Hopkins take advantage of this, um, a free benchmarking tool for districts to use to have an energy audit to see where they're at and where they can save money and energy and, and put some of those initiatives in place. And the other one was we were able to give a little bit of money and start policy around um, recruiting more teachers of color and indigenous into the classrooms. So um, kiddos can see people that look like them in front of the classroom. So we still have a really long way to go though. I would also just add, uh, we didn't talk too much about uh, gender equity issues, mm -hmm. but in the area, there are three areas where we actually were able to uh, work with the Senate and get things signed into law this year. Uh, one was uh, to el eliminate the ex uh, exception in uh, state criminal law for husbands raping their wives. Before that was not illegal, and now it is. Uh, we created a missing and murdered women's indigenous task force to address an epidemic of violence against women of color, uh, but in particular indigenous women. Uh, we also passed a sexual assault uh, task force to look at the issue of sexual assault in the state and try to address a lot of uh, kind of disparities and how that's addressed. So we were able to make progress. These are not, you know, world changing things, but through a lot of diligent hard work and pressure, we did get some things accomplished with the, with the Senate Republicans. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, I'm George Rerat, and uh, first of all, I'd like to, I've been coming here for three years, and the three of you are always here, always smiling, always listening, and I appreciate it because you, you're, you're here for the community, and I think this is a great community. It's a freezing night. You've got a packed house, um, but I really appreciate what you do here. Um, three issues that I just want to, two real quick and one maybe a little more in depth. One is insulin for all. Um, I really, I know you have a lot on your plate this session, but it's so important that that goes somewhere. And I'm not trying to be partisan, but I believe that one of the bills has greater merit for those that need it, and the other one perhaps doesn't benefit the public as much. And so whatever we can do to move to that one bill or as close to it as we can get would certainly be good for all. Um, next is clean water, um, which is kind of part of climate change, but. Uh, uh, I've been going to the Boundary Waters my entire life. Um, uh, a recent Harvard study came out showing that if the land is left alone, there's actually a greater benefit to northern Minnesota than if either of these projects move forward, Twin Bettles or Polymet. And uh, so as the economic benefit is best for our state and best for us, um, I would hope that there's some way of fencing off that pristine wilderness, which can't be replaced. Um, so I would hope that there's something that could be done. Um, as the courts are slowing things down, perhaps the legislature could find a way to fence that area off and save it for our children. Uh, and then that takes me to the last uh, area that I care about, and I've spoken to all three of you about this in the past, uh, but that's, uh, I was uh, a married father of three children. My kids are about the same ages as yours, Senator Latz. Um, so I have two that are out of high school, and my son George is in seventh grade. Um, so uh, one day my wife came home, and she decided she'd like a divorce. And what I came to find out is when you go to family court, there's only a 25% parenting time presumption. So in the state of Minnesota, unfortunately, many times fathers end up with every other weekend, and mothers end up with the balance of the children's time. Um, there have been some efforts that have been made historically uh, to change this, but uh, what uh, I'm part of a group called the Minnesota Shared Parenting Action Group, and uh, what we are hopeful for 
is that we can get uh, some kind of an equal law where when parents walk into a family court that the law would say you're on equal footing. There's not an imbalance. Um, when I think of court, I think of lady justice and equality. And unfortunately, that isn't present in current family custody law. Um, in the state of Arizona, they've passed a maximization bill so that both parents are maximized as close to 50% as possible. In the state of Kentucky, they have passed an equal shared parenting bill, 50-50, where they didn't try to use maximization language, they just called it that. In both states, the number of contested custody cases has dropped, so it's gone down. Um, domestic violence has dropped, gone down. There's less contention between the parties. It creates better certainty for the children and um, I think is better for our society. I know that when my kids were little, went to the doctor, the doctor said, George, hold your kids. Skin to skin contact is so important. They need you, they need your father, you should be around them. You go to school, the educators say, do homework with your kids, read books with your kids. You play sports with your kids. I drove my kids to hockey, soccer, basketball, all that. Took them to religious education. Both parents are important, not just one. And so I, I would hope that we could move somewhere with that this year. Unfortunately, family court separates children from their parents every day. Uh, and so kids, like mine, had uncertainty in their life. I got to 50-50, but it was a long, hard battle. And it shouldn't be that way. Kids shouldn't have to wake up wondering, can I go see one parent or the other today? They should know that the law sees their parents as equal. So that's, those are my three subjects. Thank you. Thank you for your input, George, and for uh, continuing to keep these issues uh, in front of us. Um, uh, there, there are conversations going on on insulin that have been going on for quite some time. Uh, there was, we were this close to an agreement uh, last spring and then the agreement fell apart. Uh, there's a lot of finger pointing as to why. There are now several other proposals out there. Um, part of it uh, varying degrees as to what level of financial responsibility should the uh, producers of insulin, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, pay for. Um, and uh, other questions about how do you most directly uh, get the insulin uh, into the hands of the people who need it most and how quickly and are, are there barriers along the way. Um, so I, as uh, Representative Winkler said, I, I think that's going to be a very high priority to find a solution on that one. Um, this session, there's a lot of political pressure to get that done. Um, not enough to have forced a compromise during the interim, unfortunately, but uh, I know that the governor is making it a high priority and the leaders of both parties in the legislature um, are saying that it's a high priority. So I'd expect we'll find, we'll get something accomplished uh, this spring on that. Um, clean water, uh, I share your views on both uh, Twin Metals and Polymet. Um, I think, uh, you know, once you do the kind of damage that it could be done um, from uh, a mining plan that doesn't go right, um, they're not going to walk that damage back to fix it or repair the, uh, the environment in, in our lifetimes, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're looking at having financial security, you know, to cover 500 years worth of damage. I mean. What good does that do any of us or our children or our children's children? I mean, it's a, a long ways down the road, if ever. Um, so I just think we've got to find a better way. Um, and uh, I think it's better off for the state of Minnesota as well as uh, for the, uh, the environment um, at this point if we don't authorize either of those proposals. Uh, the parenting time issue is frankly one that's even more difficult because the emotions can run so high on the topic and I, and I respect why. Um, there have been uh, a number of task forces or groups that looked for it, or groups of stakeholders that looked into these questions. Um, there was a consensus around a whole lot of changes in family law, but uh, not a consensus around this particular change um, in, in, uh, in the statutes and a lot of questions about you know, what the uh, impact can be if you go one way or another, um, if you create presumptions in the law, um, how do you, how do you give enough discretion with, in the judge's hands to, uh, to tailor the situation to fit a family's particular needs and to account for uh, input where uh, one parent is not quite as capable um, as other parents. I, I shouldn't say quite as capable. One parent could be dangerously incapable 
um, of, of uh, taking care of the children. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not an easy area. Um, I know it's going to stay on the agenda. You know, whether there'll be any progress on that is really hard to say, though, because frankly, there are a lot of people in the legislature who just don't have a great deal of knowledge on that. And uh, so we tend to listen to the people that are most involved in the community um, on implementing those kinds of changes, and there isn't a consensus there yet. And I think that's why it's kind of stalled at this point. But it's a conversation that will continue. I, I know that. And just so there was a poll done, and 87 percent of Minnesotans believe that parents should start out as equal in family court, and then the judge should weigh the facts if there are facts to change that. Yeah. Um, and the bill did enjoy great bipartisan support, both in the House and in the Senate. It passed the Judiciary Committee in the House, and it passed Karen Housley's Family Committee in the Senate. So there, there is support for it. I would appreciate you know, more of it. Yeah, what, what, because uh, you weren't at the microphone, I'll just, uh, in short uh, um, summary, uh, that uh, it did pass um, uh, a committee in the House and it's passed a committee in the Senate. There's bipartisan support and the polls show broad public support for uh, uh, equality or 50 50. Um, I think this is one of those areas where polls are not the best guideline uh, for deciding what the best policy uh, would be. Uh, everyone likes to say they're in support of equality um, or a balanced approach to things, um, but uh, when you get into the nuances of how presumptions work and how the statutes work and have an impact on uh, judicial decisions um, and litigation, um, it gets a lot more complex than that. And, and so I think this is one of those areas where uh, polling input may be relevant, but not the most important factor in deciding what the best outcome is uh, in the end. But uh, thanks for the, the information. So I, I just want to say thank you for bringing up Insulin for All. I think we're really close, and I'd like the advocates have been incredible to have their voices at the table, and I want to really thank all, uh, Governor Walls as well for kind of keeping us at the table and making sure people are talking to each other. Um, the clean water, I'm, I'm with you on the mining. The other thing I'd like to add to that is that since this is a bonding year, um, there's going to be a lot of projects hopefully across the state that address some of the clean water issues we have in our state as well when it comes to delivery of municipal systems and um, drainage and ditches and farmer farms and all that. So you'll see a lot of projects like that. And um, thank you for being an advocate um, about the shared parenting. I, I do have some concerns too. I'd be interested, maybe we can catch up some time to hear about the maximization law instead. I, I keep thinking there's gotta be a way to come to some agreement in between where we are now and where and 50-50, so I'd be interested to hear about the maximization law in the other state. Uh, so first of all, on uh, shared parenting, uh, you know, I've, we've talked many times about this. I'm generally supportive of the concept and the direction, but creating these kinds of changes in the legal system, the family court system, requires uh, more consensus building than what we've seen so far. And it's right now highly charged. There's support, but there's also a lot of very strong opposition to the bill. So I think it, more work is required to build stronger consensus around this direction before it would be ready. Um, on clean water, I, you know, I just, I always like to back up and talk about this. So PolyMed is a proposal for a copper nickel mine in the St. Louis River watershed. It is not in the Boundary Waters watershed. It's a separate, it's a project in a separate watershed. Uh, and it's on, uh, it's been permitted by the DNR and by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, there are, I think, 11 state and federal lawsuits against it pending right now. There is a, um, a review by the EPA Inspector General and by the Legislative Auditor looking at various aspects of the process for issuing the permit as well as the standards that the DNR and PCA used in issuing the permit. Uh, that really is a test case on whether Minnesota's uh, mining regulations, which were really geared towards iron mining, uh, fit in a different kind of mining context, specifically copper nickel. And there's also an issue about the uh, safety of the tailings basin and its uh, possibility of failure, which has uh, happened in other places. So uh, we have a real test in front of us in Minnesota on whether uh, a, a copper nickel mine is really something that can be safely permitted under Minnesota's existing uh, environmental standards or whether we need some different set of standards to apply. 
Um, separate from PolyMet is Twin Metals, and that is a proposal for an underground copper nickel mine right next to the Boundary Waters. And that's the study that the Harvard professor has done, which is a, says essentially that the Ely community has built such a strong economy around the um, pristine wilderness of the Boundary Waters that even if that mine were opened and were successfully operated with no contamination, it would hurt the economy of that area because it is not consistent with the type of uh, assets and amenities built in that community. So uh, that's also, that, for Twin Metals, it's a question of whether a mine should exist there at all under any circumstances. And right now, the question for PolyMed is more about whether the standards that we have are sufficient to uh, op open that mine um, safely or not. So it's, it's just kind of two separate issues. Uh, and it's always good to, in my, and, there, and there are many more potential copper nickel mines in northeastern Minnesota. So figuring out whether our standards are sufficient it, on polymet is really important for setting a precedent for future applications. Hi, I'm Kathy Christoffel. I want to thank the three of you for being here. Um, I'm fairly new to uh, St. Louis Park, which is where I live. And um, I haven't been to these before, so I regret that now. I've learned a lot, and I, I appreciate your leadership you've all shown. I've written to each of you at various times, and you're all very responsive, and I, I thank you for that as well. Um, I'm going to turn back to redistricting. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said. I, I endorse the points that have been made. I wanted to reemphasize the point about the urgency this year, because the redistricting that's done in 2021 um, will affect Minnesota for 10 years. And basically, the state has been lucky <laughs> that it has gone to the courts, because if it had not, um, we would have had various kinds of gerrymandering without a doubt. And luck is a bad plan. <laughs> you know, it's um, not a thing to count on. And I think it's time for us to have a, a plan that really works. Um, House File 1605 has tremendous grassroots support um, it's the only bill that was introduced that does. It's been modified repeatedly, working in a bipartisan fashion to accommodate many um, objections. And um, I think it is really an urgent matter that it be put forward. Um, I did write that letter, and I'll have some copies in the back for anyone who wants uh, to see it. Um, I just wanted to bring up another point about redistricting, which has not been made before, though, which is what some of you alluded to, which is the constitutional amendment versus um, not um, issue. Ideally, obviously, it would be best for a, an independent commission to have the authority to actually create the maps, um, take it out of the hands of the legislature. This has been done in many other states, and it works extremely well. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be a judge to have good judgment when you're working with experts who can explain it to you as clearly as each of you has explained things to us this evening. Um, but the, uh, the hitch is that um, some people are making the argument we have to go for the constitutional amendment because that's the ideal solution, ignoring the fact that this is not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of money, takes a lot of organizing, and the odds of it happening in this coming session in time for the 2022 redistricting is nil. It isn't going to happen. And so that it's crucially important that whatever bill passes has the um, independent commission, the multi-partisan carefully put together citizen commission in there no matter what, whether there's a constitutional provision or not. And um, we can get to the constitutional part in good time, but we have to get to the fair redistricting now. So I hope that each of you will uh, support that when the various options come before you in the coming year. Thank you for each of you supporting fair redistricting, and I uh, hope you'll keep at it. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for uh, uh, coming to your first town hall meeting. We hope you come again. Um, I will just add with regard to Senator Kiffmeyer, who is my colleague in the Senate. Uh, she's a former Secretary of State in Minnesota, and she uh, thinks of herself as the foremost expert um, on all election uh, issues. Um, and uh, unfortunately, from my perspective, her, her uh, Republican caucus defers to her um, on these issues. And the majority leader in the Senate does not uh, exercise control o enough over that committee um, and Senator Kiffmeyer to force the issue um, and uh, to, to force her over her own objection to uh, move 
legislation along or to agree to things. Uh, so uh, she really is uh, the barrier um, uh, to these issues uh, in the Senate. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, one would think that, you know, when uh, control of the Senate is at stake in the next election, that all the parties would see it's in their own self-interest to have a more neutral arbiter making these redistricting decisions down the road. Uh, you know, if the Democrats retake control of the Senate, then the Republicans are at risk, and they would be better off with a nonpartisan election commission making those decisions uh, than probably with uh, uh, the Democrats making those decisions for them. Um, so I would say it's in their self-interest as well as in the interests um, of, of the people of Minnesota uh, to pass a proposal such as we have before us now. Uh, this is my first town hall as well. I'm new to St. Louis Park from St. Paul, so across the river. Don't hold that against me. There's a one-year um, moratorium. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Shoot, I knew it. Okay. Uh, so my name is Molly Hayesberry. Um, thank you all for your time. Uh, my question relates to uh, efforts to both prevent and address sexual misconduct uh, in the legislature and then kind of more broadly in terms of other types of legislation that are floating around that would impact Minnesotans more broadly. Uh, could you each share uh, what, f what you anticipate happening this session on those issues? Well, I'll jump in first just to say one thing we have done last year and this year at the insistence of our speaker and majority leader in the House is actually have sexual harassment training that is consistent um, and that staff's included too. And we've also had racial bias training, which is very nice, very, it was very much needed as well. Um, and I think I'll kick it over to the two lawyers to explain what we've done and where we're headed. Uh, so I mentioned a few things that we actually got put it passed mm -hmm. into law. Uh, those Two of those, unfortunately, are still task forces, and the other is a defense to rape that I think is, uh, well, it's used, but very rarely. Um, so, you know, it isn't, those things are kind of steps along this path, not final answers to any of these issues. But within the legislature itself, I think there's been a change uh, regarding sexual harassment, if that's what you were asking about. Um, that and also just more more broadly yeah. too. So both within the legislature, different cultural things or different <laughs> rules or kind of how how or if things have shifted in the past couple of years with everything that's come out in the open, um, and then also building on uh, the information you shared earlier. Uh, like particularly, I'm, I'm interested in you know, what's next for those task forces, or is there anything else in the wings uh, under development? Uh, that would have a broader impact on all Minnesotans beyond the legislature. Sure. So one of the outcomes of kind of the experience of uh, a senator and a representative both resigning their offices because of uh, sexual harassment at the legislature and the Me Too movement happening at the same time was an effort to change the sexual harassment standard in Minnesota uh, away from a severe and pervasive standard uh, that has developed through the court system over time that has really made it very very difficult to establish sexual harassment uh, in the workplace in Minnesota today. And we worked hard to try to get a compromise with, frankly, uh, the business community uh, who's concerned about uh, lawsuits, I suppose. Um, and they have worked closely with Republicans to try to slow down or severely weaken the change in that standard, but we are uh, going to keep pushing for that this coming year, and there is a possibility that we could get something done because it's a difficult thing to oppose. I mean, the stories are pretty horrible, frankly, about the kinds of things that women have had to put up with in the workplace, and the courts say, well, you're not really meeting the severe and pervasive. Just because it happens once isn't really enough. It has to happen over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty unfortunate. Um, and culturally, I think the change in the House with two legislators resigning has been for the better. Um, we've had training. We have uh, anti-harassment uh, warnings up in the building now. And that doesn't sound like much, but it was a real lift to get uh, that amount of cultural change done. And um, uh, it's, it's going to be an ongoing challenge, especially at the legislature, where there's always a power dynamic. Um, and it can be very difficult to speak out against people who have tremendous power over 
uh, your personal livelihood, but also the ability to represent your clients if you're a lobbyist, for example. And so um, it's a long-term effort, but a focused and determined effort to try to change the culture internally as well as you know, in the workplace for all women. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, add on to this. Um, <clears throat> we in the Senate also went through uh, formal training um, on uh, sexual harassment and, and how to be careful as legislators um, and how to recognize, uh, you know, issues and how to handle it if staff members come to us to share information with us about issues they're having with perhaps another legislator, another staff member, a lobbyist, uh, or any of the other uh, people that are at the Capitol. Um, so it's, it's important that we be able to be effective listeners and reporters um, as well, that we know what conduct is considered to be unacceptable and, and uh, uh, so that we don't do anything that is wrong. Um, but we all went through formal training um, as well, and we had some uh, open and, and uh, uh, very interesting and helpful conversations uh, among the legislators and the HR uh, 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 staff um, in the Senate. Um, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little familiar with this stuff because it's part of what I do as a private practice lawyer is represent victims of sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, so I see it from that perspective as well, and, and this severe and pervasive standard uh, is, is woefully unfair. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, there's so many valid claims that simply don't have a remedy uh, because of, of this barrier in the law that is, is uh, unwieldy and way too high um, and way overprotective of, of organizations, businesses, or, or others um, where this conduct occurs and where the businesses are in a position um, or should be held to be in a position uh, of preventing um, or remedying uh, when it happens. Um, so that's uh, one thing that I hope that we can get accomplished. Uh, the, um, there was a Star Tribune series that generated a lot of uh, the legislative activity in the last uh, legislative session. Uh, most of that activity was in the House uh, that came to the table uh, in conference committee in the Judiciary and Public Safety Bill with a lot of proposals, um, uh, uh, many of which were, were uh, very uh, thoughtful, helpful, and ought to have become law. Um, uh, one thing that the series brought out was um, the difficulty that agencies have had in doing the investigations for a variety of reasons. Um, part of it's a lack of resources, part of it's a lack of training, uh, training of the investigators, um, how to do an effective investigation. Part of it is a function of uh, prioritizing resources uh, within the investigative agencies. I'm talking about the law enforcement agencies here. Um, and, uh, and then the, the manner in which they interview people um, so that they can get the most information, the most helpful information that can be followed up on. Part of the problem was a lot of people, complainants just weren't even getting interviewed. Um, and uh, so they get, in a sense, re-victimized um, by the agencies that are supposed to be helping them. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we can do and I know as a result of the, uh, the series, a lot of agencies, law enforcement agencies, have undertaken on their own changes in their practices and policies and, and resource allocation uh, to prioritize this. Uh, this goes back even further, uh, issues over uh, whether or not rape kits get tested. Um, and uh, there are a lot of rape kits that are sitting on shelves that haven't been tested yet. Some because the complainants didn't want them tested, uh, but most because uh, there was just uh, insufficient prioritization of resources devoted uh, to the rape kit, uh, te uh, kit testing. Um, and uh, communities are, are working through that backlog um, as well. Uh, some of the proposals for changes get into nuances about uh, presumptions um, in, in uh, evidence, definitions of terms in the criminal area, um, and uh, can turn into bigger discussions about uh, constitutional rights um, of all the parties uh, in, in a criminal justice process um, as well. Um, and those tend to be the most fraught conversations because we're balancing um, holding government accountable uh, when they do investigations and bring criminal charges against uh, the rights of victims uh, to be heard and have their cases brought and to be uh, successfully prosecuted um, when the evidence is there to support it. So uh, those conversations get a little bit uh, more difficult to have. Um, but uh, we have a task force that's taking a look at this. It's a pretty broad-based task force. Um, from what I understand, there's a fair amount of contention 
on the task force uh, right now also about how to address some of these, uh, these uh, legal questions. Um, so I, their report, I think, is due before the legislative session begins. Um, so we will have some more information uh, from them about what they propose. Um, I've heard we might get a minority report from the task force as well, mm -hmm. that they might not reach consensus on everything. Um, but it's one of those issues that, frankly, will probably be difficult to deal with in, in, uh, in a shorter legislative session. But uh, hopefully there'll be some consensus that we can develop um, around most of the proposals and can make some real progress on it. Do you have anything to or? I was just going to say with the severe and pervasive, when it first came up two years ago, we actually had some really good bipartisan support. And then we had to break uh, for, for interim. And then that changed when some of the other groups got involved, um, mostly some of the, the larger, the Minnesota Chamber. And um, I think it's going to take some cultural pressure. In my mind, bottom line is that if you're doing a job as a business, that shouldn't worry you. So. It's going to have to take some more cultural shift, too. But you can see why I kicked it over to the lawyers. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm Michael Schwartz, St. Louis Park. Um, I'm actually also here from a group that uh, works on redistricting, and a lot of us are here and have done a lot of lobbying and door knocking um, on that issue. Um, I have to say that I actually am intrigued by the idea of a bill that would set up a structure of a commission and try to pass it as a constitutional amendment. And if that didn't work, automatically have it become an independent commission or advisory commission. But I think that we've talked about redistricting a lot and done a very good job on both sides here talking about that. So I want to bring up two points on climate change um, that haven't been talked about. Um, and I really am happy with the work that you have done getting things passed as you could and proposals that the Wealth Administration has made, especially for electric vehicles and other issues. Um, I want to bring up one issue is re, uh, something called regenerative agriculture, which is the idea that um, farmers, by making changes in the way they work their soil, they do their farming, um, the soil can become an absorber of carbon dioxide instead of a source of it. And there are studies, I think, that say that um, this can make a decent contribution to um, decreasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And because it decreases the uh, inputs that farmers have to make uh, for fertilizer, irrigation, whatever, it can actually save farmers money. Um, it seems like that might be one thing in the area of climate change that uh, people who represent agricultural communities, because it saves money for farmers, might actually have a reason to support. Um, the other issue I'd like to bring up is that there's a lot of things that need to be done in the area of climate change that actually are regressive. Um, so that if you want to raise the gas tax to discourage people from driving with gas guzzling cars or to buy electric vehicles, that it's the people with less money who are most affected by that who don't have the money to pay for it. If you want people to buy electric vehicles, that's an expensive thing to do for people without a lot of money. Um, and uh, even if you, if you want to do something like carbon tax, which would be a very important way to decrease the amount of carbon that we're emitting, that also tends to raise costs and is most effect the, uh, affects the people who have less money most strongly. And I think it's very important as you do those things, which I hope you'll manage to do, to include other provisions in there that um, would make it less burdensome raising minimum wages or giving rebates or subsidies for the purchases, um, various issues like that. Uh, that's all. Thanks, Mike, for coming out. Appreciate that. Um, I support everything that you've said. Um, it, it's just one of those issues that has so many dimensions to it. Uh, the conversation is going to have to keep continuing. But I think there's a consensus that's being developed about the importance of addressing climate change. Um, and the question is going to be, what can we get a consensus on in terms of specific proposals uh, to try to move the ball forward rather than shifting the burden any further onto the next couple of generations? And I serve on the Transportation Committee. We had a lot of great discussions and some policy around electric vehicles. We couldn't quite get across the finish line. I would have to say, though, I am in support of a gas tax increase, but we approached it in a way that would uh, we could make it 
less burdensome on folks that had an income issue um, because actually the gas tax goes to our infrastructure, which relieves congestion, which then puts less carbon and stuff in the air. So, but there is, it's finding that balance and striking that balance to make sure that we're not um, doing more harm than good. I, I do support gas tax. All right. Thank you. I guess maybe I'll add one more thing. Um, and and uh, as Gail steps up to the mic as well, uh, um, transit and Southwest LRT. Um, Gail was, was a tireless advocate uh, for Southwest LRT. Uh, she and I worked together. We've all worked. Uh, Cheryl was on um, the local committee that uh, was meeting regularly to, to shape that uh, project as well. And Ryan's been a very strong supporter along the way. And uh, shovels are in the ground. Construction's going on. It's happening. Um, and it's just one of those pieces of a mass transit system that will alleviate pressure on our congested highways and pressure on our environment as well. Um, so uh, it's a good segue Thank to you. our uh, final to long time. Thank you. Final Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. I'm Gail Dorfman, longtime resident of St. Louis Park. I wanted to mention another electoral reform issue. I've been active in the Fair Vote Minnesota movement, advocating ranked choice voting across the state. Um, ranked choice voting, as you well know, eliminates the low turnout primary and moves to one general election in November where voters can um, prioritize, rank by preference, their candidates. We think this is meaningful reform that encourages greater participation by voters, that also leads to more civil um, dialogue during campaigns. There's no incentive to bash your opponent, and also makes creates more opportunity for a more diverse candidate pool. And as you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul and now St. Louis Park over the last year have implemented ranked choice voting, but 85% of the communities in our state, then many that we're working with, like Red Wing, who are active or eager to move forward with ranked choice, can't because they don't have the authority to do that. Um, and it would require a local options legislation, um, passage <clears throat> of local options in order for them to consider implementing ranked choice voting in their communities. So I know that the current um, Secretary of State strongly supports local option and I think was an author of the local options bill when he was in the legislature. Um, so unlike the former um, Secretary of State who continues to be an obstacle as you've raised with these issues, I just wanted to get your take on local options this year. Is it something that you'll continue to push forward in the hopes that we can move in that direction over the next year. And then I, I, would, I would last say before you answer that, that I've worked with all three of you for a long, long time, and I think we are really fortunate in our communities, St. Louis Park, Hopkins, and the others, Golden Valley, um, to have this level of leadership representing our community. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Gail. You kind of make me feel bad because uh, I'm a reluctant supporter of the local options. I do support it uh, so that local communities can experiment with ranked choice voting. Um, I'm less uh, of a fan. But um, why? why? Yeah. Uh, because I think uh, in general election outcomes that are simple to understand have the most electoral buy-in. Um, and so to me, uh, whoever gets the most votes should win. And that is the easiest thing for people to understand and feel like they understand the outcome happening the way it did. But uh, as I said, that's the voice of a skeptic, not a, an outright opponent. And I do support the ability to do that at the local level and support the local options bill. Uh, Gail, I assume you mean uh, the statutory cities need that authority. Uh, St. Louis Park's a charter city, and Minneapolis and St. Paul are charter cities, so they don't need the statutory authority to do it. They can do it on their own if they wish, um, which we have done. Um, I think it's worked well in, in St. Louis Park. The last election was a very successful one. Um, and uh, um, I would uh, put even a finer point on it. Uh, there's no incentive to bash your opponent. Actually, there's an incentive not to bash your opponent um, in those uh, environments. Um, so it doesn't mean that you can't bring out uh, important distinctions between the candidates, which I think is also helpful. But the manner in which you do it um, is important, too. It affects the, the level of civic discourse in our communities. and so. There's a real value to uh, ranked choice voting, uh, certainly in the local communities. 
And I'm a local option supporter as well, just because I think um, it's easier to explain at the local level for folks to understand it, because it does take an education piece, as Representative Winkler said. Um, I'm more of a skeptic on the other side about the bashing. I think that still happens privately anyway. But <laughs> we can all shoot for being better, so. Um, all right, well, we've, we've reached uh, 8.35. Uh, before we adjourn, I just want to give each of us an opportunity to make a few uh, wrap-up remarks if we wish. Uh, so, Brian, do you want to sure. say anything in closing? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. First of all, um, I want to point out my legislative assistant, Binta Conte, standing in the back. Uh, Binta is uh, the person uh, who will take phone calls, uh, uh, make a lot of initial responses, and help field a lot of constituent uh, issues if they come to my office. And um, uh, I would encourage you to sign up in the back, uh, in the sign-up sheet, to be in touch with us uh, through phone, email, whatever you want to do. Uh, and whether it's a public policy issue that concerns you or an issue dealing with a state agency or some personal issue where you need uh, some official support of some kind, please feel free to reach out to us. That is a big part of what we do. Uh, and um, it's in many ways the most satisfying work that we do. Uh, the other thing I'd like to uh, just say is that uh, we've referenced uh, Secretary Steve Simon indirectly. Uh, a proud alum of this uh, town hall series. And um, I also just want to say that uh, St. Louis Park and its values are extremely well represented in our lieutenant governor. Um, and uh, Peggy Flanagan's presence in the Walls administration has been a force for real good and a force for really some significant changes, including the first increase in the uh, cash assistance program in the temporary aid for needy families in 20 years. It would not have happened without Peggy Flanagan being the lieutenant governor, and we should all thank her for that. <laughs> That's just one example. There are many, many other things, but I think that is something that has been on the, on, on the burner for so long that it finally got done because of you. So uh, there are many, uh, many more uh, additional things as well. I would echo that, and having a child's advocate in the, in the lieutenant governor's office has been absolutely amazing and has made my job as education policy chair much easier. Um, I also want to hold up uh, former state senator Steve Kelly, who is our commerce commissioner as well. So we're, and, um, we're well represented uh, between uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, Secretary of State Steve Simon, Commissioner um, Steve Kelly. So we're very lucky here and ha always have very big shoes to fill for those of us who are left up here. Um, I uh, have some cards in the back with my contact information. If you go to my house website and sign up for my weekly review that I send out um, during session, it also has, I just um, set up my six community conversations between now and the end of March at the local libraries that I would love to have folks attend. And I'd also echo what uh, Representative Wiggler said about one of our major jobs is being an ombudsman between constituents and state agencies. So always feel free to contact any of us if there's issues. And thank you for coming tonight. Um, so I'll make a couple of notes. So one is my legislative assistant, Marcus uh, Baroni, is in the back as well. Uh, so uh, uh, we provide the same kind of service on the Senate side of things that our representatives do for our constituents. So please sign up, give us your contact information if you like. Uh, and if you have any issues you'd like us to help you with, uh, you can contact our Senate office as well. And, and we work together um, so that we aren't duplicating resources, uh, but also we can provide the most effective help that we can. Uh, for our constituents. Uh, there are going to be two additional town halls this year before the legislative session. Uh, and uh, so watch uh, the community notices, if you will, for uh, specifics on dates and times. Uh, we'll have uh, one on the A side of the district, one on the B side of the district uh, to give more people an opportunity to come by if they'd like to do so that perhaps couldn't make it uh, tonight. Uh, maybe a little bit closer uh, to home for some of them um, as well. Uh, I want to note uh, one other thing before we wrap up. Uh, an issue that I've been working on for many, many years is represented in the front row here with Moms Demand Action, uh, and that is uh, legislation to reduce gun violence in our communities. Uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm the chief author in the Senate um, of uh, the bill to expand background checks uh, to most private uh, purchases or uh, transactions of, of, uh, of firearms uh, relating to handguns and uh, semi-automatic military-style assault weapons. Um, and uh, I'm also the chief author of the red flag bill um, in the Senate, which would give 
uh, the courts uh, initiated by law enforcement and, uh, and family members an opportunity uh, to step in when a person is in crisis um, and separate them uh, from, uh, from any firearms that they own uh, for a temporary solution uh, so that they don't act out with the firearms at their disposal. Um, so uh, we will have continuing discussions on those. The Senate Judiciary Committee is actually going to have a hearing on this in Hibbing, Minnesota on January 21st. Um, and, uh, and I hope we'll have continued conversations this upcoming legislative session um, on those. And if we don't get it passed this year, we'll pass them next year. So with that said, thank you. Um, uh, with that said, thank you all of you for spending your evening with us. Uh, for those of you listening at home, um, as well, and have a good night. <laughs>